All right, so um, welcome back after the break, everyone. I guess I'll be the uh, after lunch speaker on testing strategies. This talk has uh, a condensed version of, of a lot of the ideas that our team has discussed and talked about um, for several years on testing. Uh, yesterday, we actually heard from the, the Shazeb Siddiqui on the build test project, and, and there they had you know, ways to run your tests. This talk, we'll talk about um, what goes into those tests and how should you organize your, your testing suite? How do you think about a definition of done for tests? Things like that. Hopefully, you'll come away from this talk with kind of a renewed sense of um, understanding of what exactly you're testing, what should you be testing, and how far away are you from, from an ideal uh, kind of standpoint on getting your code up to snuff. So let's begin with kind of a hypothetical situation where um, you have a, a science discussion and you decide uh, we want to test out a, a new time integrator method for an atmospheric transport equation. It's it's finite volume, but uses a different way to kind of limit the oscillations that that can occur and, and lead to instability. Um, and so of course it's conversation. How, how do we how does it work on one D transport? Maybe it preserves shapes a little bit better. Um, so we want to actually make this thing work inside of our code and, and see how, how it will do. Uh, how do we test it? Well, we have to compare the old and the new integration inputs. Uh, we got to change the grid resolution and, and get timings and ensure that everything is as it's supposed to be. Um, so this is maybe a, a little bit of a background on, on what kind of situation you, you might be going into and thinking about testing. And it's actually, uh, Matthew Norman is a colleague of mine at um, the National Center for Computational Sciences at, at Oak Ridge. We, work as liaisons with uh, science projects that want to use the giant supercomputer uh, summit and now Frontier. And if you have an idea that requires uh, 100,000 node hours on Frontier, let me know. We'd be more than happy to discuss ways to uh, get that up and running. OK, so what is testing? Whenever you write a code or whenever you're adding new functionality to your code, you're, and whenever you think about your designs, you're actually you're thinking about ways that you can test those designs. So you're, you're compiling it, you're testing for defects in the syntax. When you run your code the first time, you're testing if it's doing the correct thing. And when you add things and run again, um, you're continuing to test. So the development cycle actually has testing built in. Um, it's an integral part of that. But the problem is uh, we're not always capturing those tests. We're not taking all of the accumulated knowledge that we have, that we've gathered by the hard one process of developing and thinking about what we're what's correct for our code and, and capturing it. This is not me running. Okay. We don't, he's a, okay. In-person conferences. All right, so um, with that, uh, we'll go back to our example. Uh, here's a 2D result from the new integrator method. And you have a hot front meets a cold front and, and they're moving forwards in time. You, you get some nice um, structure preservation and, and conservation properties and everything looks good. Great, uh, let's get the code switched over. This will be easier uh, and faster and safer if we have the right tests in the right place. So, um, you know, just getting the numerical result is, is not the end. Uh, the, the end of the, uh, the process, you've got to take that numerical result and turn it into something that's a you know, reproducible workflow that, that fits into what you're actually doing. Um, so this gets us into a consideration of, of test and, and documentation driven development. You're considering new code. If you take the time to write down exactly what your motivation uh, for putting in this new code is and what the new code will do and what it will achieve, then when you've actually gone through this entire cycle and completed it, you will now have a document that explains, um, you know, when you started, how great this was going to be. <clears throat> and that's great for being able to show that you're you know, checking off milestones, but also it, it gives you a sense of um, accomplishment when, when things are done. Um, once you've considered that new code, it should lead naturally to an explanation of what needs to be tested. You know, what's the definition of this feature being integrated and working? Um, you should implement those tests and implement and modify the code. Sometimes, um, it, sometimes the tests and the code get written kind of simultaneously with the design document, and it's all part of a, a cycle. But it's important to keep in mind that that there are those three things that are happening. It's not just writing code and running it. It's it's writing down the documentation and writing down the tests 
and, and of course, there's the, the development cycle with writing the code and testing. Um, now I'll get into some general uh, tips and strategies on building your test suite. There's a lot of different terminology and a lot of different ways to slice your source code. And so there are a, a correspondingly large space of ways to test your code. Uh, it's good to think on two levels and as in um, more long running, complicated and, and complex tests, you can think of as, as running inside of an automated or scheduled testing system. Uh, these can try and be comprehensive, um, almost like the academic CV that's 30 pages long. You get you know, an entire comprehensive picture of, of everything that your code is doing and where it is in performance, and it might require lots of resources, but, but it's important to test all of that. And then you also want to have a quick test, which will quickly diagnose errors um, and, and can be run continuously on new code check-ins. And that piece should go into your continuous integration pipeline. And having, having your test kind of separated this way will help your developers to ease their frustrations of a development cycle being, being fast and having small um, modular updates. For rules of thumb for a test, your test should be as simple as possible. If you have to do um, 100 lines of setup code before you run your test, it probably means that you have a function of a, a setup function that's missing from your main source code. Um, they should also enable you to pinpoint an error because if you have a test that doesn't actually say where the error is coming from, then your test isn't um, your, your test isn't granular enough. You want to have a mix of different granularities, and I'll have a kind of an illustrative example of that later. But basically, what the the granularity idea is is that you you test with unit tests that grow larger and larger until they become integration tests, and that way you're able to kind of uh, if you see a test failing, you'll see it failing up the stack, and you can funnel um, kind of down into down into the um, the bottom of where your error is occurring. You can also think about things like uh, restart tests or um, right checking your checkpoint and, and restart process. All right, so types of tests. Um, let's see. So I want to start with this one. Uh, Well-known tests for enterprise software. Unit tests are the, the thing that verifies a single function. They're, they're simple and they're extremely quick to run. Regression tests are where, they, where you're looking for old bugs that have occurred. Usually when a bug is reported, um, the first thing you'll want to do with that bug report is, is reproduce it. And that reproducer of the bug report makes a great test. Make sure that you save it. That becomes your regression test later. Uh, so that it, it, those regression tests are also more helpful because if that became a bug from development mistakes in the past, it's also likely to reoccur with development mistakes in the future. <clears throat> so those regression tests are valuable. Integration tests are where you're putting modules together um, and eventually putting packages together and making sure that everything is um, working together. You're testing the interfaces between the modules and packages. System tests are where you're actually um, verifying that the software works on a particular system. And so you're pairing uh, pairing the, in the software with the, with the OS environment. And acceptance tests are uh, kind of an industry, um, an industry term that's, that's looking at whether or not, um, if you have a, a specific set of criteria that your program needs to meet, whether or not your program and your, your entire system uh, meets those criteria. Um, there are additional types of tests that we have for research software, um, which are things like uh, composite unit tests that look for specific functionalities or capabilities. So you want to know whether or not it, it, uh, your code can handle a particular science case that becomes a composite unit test. There are also um, ways to verify correct behavior of interoperating functional units um, at different granularities. I have a lecture later. Um, I mentioned restart tests briefly before. That's uh, where your code can restart transparently from a checkpointed state. It's important to have checkpoint and restart capability as your um, compute needs get larger and your jobs start to require um, potentially more time than you can get in a single run. Um, and performance tests are obviously checking that you're not um, slowing things down significantly as you make uh, refactoring or, or you make um, changes to the underlying components in your software stack. 
You can also break down tests in terms of classes of tests. I'm gonna call this open box testing and closed box testing. Um, and I'm probably the one that people are most familiar with is closed box testing, where you don't really know the internals of the code being tested. You can't modify the code. Um, it, it happens to kind of a third party or legacy code. So what you do is you make uh, an output that you trust and you verify that that output um, on future runs matches the golden output that you had before. Um, and this is a simple way of just testing that, that whatever's inside that, that box that you got from the vendor is still functioning the way that you expect that it is functioning. Um, open box testing is where you actually have uh, some control over the internals of the code. You're able to you know, jump into a module or a function and put in some assertions um, or insert snippets of, uh, of maybe exporting some information that lets you get into the test a little bit better. All right, so let's follow through with our hypothetical situation where we've integrated, we've implemented a new um, oscillation limiter inside of a inside of an Euler integrator. We've made some changes in these yellow boxes, right? So we we changed the time integrator, but we also changed maybe some details of the mathematical libraries, or we added something here. And what happens now is that there's some pieces of the code that I've highlighted in blue which are um, things that you're pretty sure are still good and don't need to be retested or, or reworked. But then there's all these pieces in red, which if you have test cases for them, these are test cases which will give you a lot of information about the code changes that you just made. Um, and it's great to be able to build your tests to this level where you have, where you have tests that cover each one of these different functions. Um, having made a change to the time integrator, you wanna know that your downstreams are still working, right? So you have test cases. Ideally, you already had test cases in place before you made the change that were working and you understood very well. And now that you've made the change, you can simply run those test cases again, get some outputs and show that everything is working. And this is, um, this is kind of showing you why having existing tests will speed your productivity in doing things with your code. You also wanna think about your external consumer packages. So if there are downstream consumers of your package, you need to understand the impacts of your change on their code. So if they have tests that are um, you know, import tests from you, those are good to run as well. Um, and obviously you, you might need to double check your output routines because there might be some changes in output formats. Okay, so um, having gone through that quick testing scenario, uh, I'll add some additional notes on good testing practices. Um, verifying code coverage is one quick way, quick visual way that you can use to see whether or not tests are actually um, being implemented for different parts of your code base. Um, what I mean by code coverage, I actually have a picture of this even, but uh, we had a picture earlier on in the tutorial um, from Pat, which showed, which showed uh, lines of code from a, from a single source file and some of the codes, some of the lines of code weren't being exercised when you run um, the GCC with the code cub option um, enabled, or if you hook your um, CI pipeline into code cub, um, into codecub.io, then you can actually look, um, look at graphical summaries of which source files and which lines and which functions have been exercised by the testing suite that you have. It's also good if you're going to be in the business of writing tests and using tests to have a consistent policy on what to do when they fail. Um, it's great to be able to, to address those by issue tracking, um, to have a bug report that comes in specifically and explains what's wrong, um, and then follow through on, on the, um, the GitHub issue that corresponds to that bug report with what changes and updates have been made to the code to make the tests working again. Um, it's also good to have someone watching the test suite, not necessarily someone responsible for fixing all of the bugs, but for triaging and recognizing that there is a new bug that came in and marking it as a bug and handing it off to one of the team members. Um, I've seen really good examples of this before where, where a facility liaison was able to track, to track a bug in the, um, the OpenMP stack. And what they did was they talked about the status of the code, the status of the compiler, and the status of you know, these three different groups that all had to work together to get the bug resolved. And just by sending out this update on what the current progress was this week, they were able to get people on the same page and stay focused on what the real bug was between the three code bases. Um, when refactoring or adding new features, run a regression suite before check-in. Um, those regression tests are really great for catching 
uh, errors that creep in while you're while you're refactoring. And there are some, there are a lot of vendors that will help you optimize your code. Uh, you can you can take your code to um, AMD or Intel or NVIDIA and ask them make this faster. Um, a lot of times they'll be willing to work with you on that, but they will be very hesitant if you don't have any test suite because they may make some changes and have no understanding of what the impact of what the changes that they've made. So having a test suite will also help you get collaborators to, to help you with pieces of your code. A test suite is also great to do code review before releasing. Um, it's also good to do to do uh, code review before you make a release. And this is maybe worded slightly incorrectly. Um, okay, so do some code review before you uh, do some code review and do testing before you make releases, because that will ensure that errors don't come out in your releases. Maintaining old releases of your code is a is a time consuming process, and having good tests and code review before you release code. Uh, will prevent you from having to invest that time. All right, and so I want to end with a little bit more complicated example. Um, that I've talked about you know adding a new piece of code. What if I have an existing piece of code which doesn't, which which has a very large footprint, and I want to test a small area of the code, or I want to make some changes in the small area of the code, but I don't want to implement a test suite for the entire thing because that's out of scope. Um, this example comes from the E3SM code. That uh, that Anshu Dubey from ANL was a uh, was a collaborator on, and she implemented this process to actually get the um, to get the piece of the code that they wanted to optimize tested and up to snuff. Um, this is a Fortran code with lots of modules, and so the process she followed was to isolate a small area of the code, uh, dump a useful state snapshot because there's a you know a lot of computations in progress, and when this small when this this module is called in particular that they wanted to update and refactor, it requires um, kind of a, a bunch of external state. And so there was a process of, of actually dumping that state to a file and writing a parser for it. Um, and also there's a little bit of a source code issue because in order for the small piece of code that, that she wanted to exercise uh, to actually get run, it required some external dependencies to other pieces of the code. So some of those had to be um, some of those had to be kind of uh, papered over so that the dependencies would work. Okay, so link in de dependencies, if there, were, if there were customizations to the dependencies needed to load the state and get the test driver working, you might actually have to kind of overlay some of those dependencies. Um, and there's a, there's a graphic of how this works. All right, so we take this small piece of code out, we isolate it, we think about the state that's needed to run it, and we build a driver which can, um, which can interface to the other pieces of the code. Um, if you have an external piece of the code, you can copy that into the driver and make the local modifications needed. The driver is then responsible for loading up the state and exercising the piece. And in this case, it's a lot of work to do this entire process, but it paid off because rather than requiring um, rather than requiring a job which took up many nodes and an hour on a supercomputer to run the test, it was now able to run in a few minutes on a developer's laptop because of the level of isolation that was achieved for this particular um, sub area of the code. Okay, uh, so how to build your test suite. We've talked a little bit about this already. Uh, use a mix of granularities, um, unit tests all the way up through integration tests. Think about restarting your code um, and ask yourself, what value does this test add? Um, is it simple? Does it enable me to quickly pinpoint my error? I'm gonna put this rejoinder here on code coverage tools. There are many ways to get to code coverage. Um, so there's no excuse. You should be able to find code coverage tools for your project. And um, as another way, kind of as a, inside of a developer team meeting on a, a, building a strategy for testing, you can also think about this kind of a test matrix. So independently from code coverage, what the test matrix here is showing is, um, is the flash code which has multiple different physics functions, hydro equations of state, gravity, particles, et cetera, but it also has multiple code modules, things that do the adaptive meshing or the multi-grid or the fast Fourier transform. And so what the, what the coverage grid is, is doing is it's saying for every one of my tests, which physics capability is it exercising and which module is it exercising? And by going through the tests kind of from in this order of, of simple unit tests all the way up through complex uh, multi-physics tests and filling in where they fit on the grid, you're able to get a visual picture of 
what's being tested um, and show kind of the, the developers and the, the physics users of this code exactly uh, where the tests are and where we can expect to get our feedback from. There's also some gaps in here, like AMR doesn't apply to gravity, and that's an understandable thing that has to do with just the, the way that the physics runs. So um, gaps are not necessarily a bad thing. It tells you more about the structure of your code. All right, so I'm actually going to, uh, I don't think I have anything else other than takeaways and, and conclusions here, so that's it. Um, rules of thumb, test your tests. Make sure your tests fail when they're supposed to. Have a test, not just expected to fail, but like tests that an error is returned and that the error is the error that you think it should be. Um, add regression tests to make sure your old bugs aren't reappearing. Test regularly. Um, have fast running continuous integration tests, but also if you have a larger code base that takes longer to run, have some scheduled nightly tests. Um, this is important when teams are adding code regularly and um, they'll help you identify and document where the changes to your platform, et cetera, have influenced your code correctness. Automate your regular testing, use an automation framework, rely on um, people who have implemented automation frameworks before. Uh, once you put in that effort to automate your tests, then it pays back over time um, and you don't have to continue, um, continue to, to build more automation. Um, Test your assumptions, exercise your third party dependencies, prove that they work for your case when you're adding them in. Um, add tests when you're joining new code, stash the tests used that you have used to diagnose issues. Um, and think about testing strategies that are also physics based. Um, look at conserved quantities and symmetries, synthetic operators, use the specifications of how your code is supposed to work. What are the error tolerances? Um, how are these modules supposed to work together? Use those kinds of, of specifications to guide where your testing will fit. All right, and so with that, I'm just gonna um, give you one more slide of takeaways. Um, have a testing strategy, use automation. There's different challenges associated with different kinds of code bases. Uh, legacy codes without the existing tests can be a little bit more difficult and you have to be careful where you put your effort in there. Um, but eventually you wanna verify all the components if you're releasing the code. Don't get distracted by having too many technologies and focus on exercising your code. Um, start small and, and do something that works rather than try and adopt absolutely everything because it's better to start small and have something that works. Um, so with that, here's just a summary of the things that I covered with testing and I'll open the floor for questions. Uh, thanks. Uh, that's great so far. Um, I guess one thing that I've been, uh, I struggle with is, is code coverage on legacy models. Um, and cause writing new code, you can think of ways to exercise, exercise it, but legacy models that are already tens and or hundreds, thousands of lines up to millions, even, um, I've just never really thought of a, could think of a good strategy to start figuring out how to test that robustly to get good code coverage um, because sometimes you might, or for instance, in a climate simulation, you only get into one exercise, a single piece of code once over a hundred years when it gets into a specific realm. Like it's, it's kind of, how do you really do that? You would hope that the original developer did some testing, but I was just curious if you have any comments on strategies about trying to improve code coverage on these massive legacy models that are still in development and getting improved upon, but it's, um, yeah, that's just been one of the big difficulties that I've had for this code coverage question. It sounds like you, you might have a lot of experience with this and, and maybe have some of the answers. Um, I might consider this as a closed box testing problem where you're just going to kind of isolate it as much as you can and make sure that the inputs and the outputs are what you expect. Mm -hmm. But if you're if you're hacking on you know a piece of that code base, maybe that's the, the piece that you need to add the tests for the most. Yeah. Yeah, because typically that is the way we do it is we look at the out outputs at the end, we reduce it, a massive climate state down to a single checksum, and then we use that to check the answers. But yeah, it's just difficult. <laughs> I've been trying to think of how do we encourage developers to think about code coverage for testing. Um, and yeah, but yeah, it was a difficult problem. So. One, one idea to approach that might be to take the 
the way that David talked about to, that was used to isolate the particular pieces. And if you were, if you could instrument the code that you were interested in improving the coverage for and include that in like a century simulation run or something like that and identify where the, the code that you're missing has or um, gets exercised and then capture those snapshots as state that you can use the technique that David talked about that, you know, it's, it only gets you part of the way there because you're relying on, you know, um, what, what is exactly going in and out. So it's pretty specific, but it's at least something that you didn't have before. And if you just instrument where that's, where those um, paths through the code are being exercised, you might be able to identify that in the long run or something. Then we do have a question from online from Sean. It's a two part question. So uh, from the previous presentations on project management adjacent techniques such as Scrum, Agile, et cetera, how do you budget time for testing and fixing broken tests? Or how do you convince project management to incorporate time for this type of coding? Then the follow-up is how much time should project management budget for code coverage and test generation? I tend to budget 15% for myself, but that may not work for everyone on every project. It's, this is a difficult question and I'm gonna have to defer to the answer that we had earlier of, of kind of do these things with your team and have an estimate of, how to have a beginning estimate and then track how long it actually took and use that to calibrate yourself and your estimates. 15% um, sounds like it, it could be a reasonable amount of time, um, but I would also caution to, to put together a mental model at, at kind of the level of a, of a feature that you're adding rather than at a, a whole project level because they're very different kinds of estimates. Um, and so for one feature that you're adding, you, you might say that I'm gonna need 15% of my time to get the, uh, the, the test and the CI stuff working. Um, and, and that's reasonable. But if you're trying to make a wholesale change, then that's a different kind of estimate. All right, thanks. And with that, I will uh, welcome Patricia Peter for our next. I'm gonna put up the next stock. <laughs>